From 2000 to 2011, seven Indigenous high school students died in Thunder Bay, Ontario. They were hundreds of kilometers away from their families, forced to leave their homes due to there being no adequate high schools on their reserves respectfully. Sadly, even after a variety of protests, the tragedies are still occurring today in this northern city, thanks in large part to the police force in Thunder Bay. The police have contributed to the mistreatment of the Indigenous throughout the course of history, as we will be discussing throughout our video. We will also be discussing how they ultimately contributed to the mishandling of several cases involving the Indigenous people within the Thunder Bay area. The distrust between police and the Indigenous community started decades ago, when Mounties would drag Aboriginal children from their homes and take them to residential schools against their will. This distrust never went away and even grew in some communities over time. In Thunder Bay especially, police distrust is at an all-time high due to the systematic racism within the police force. The city alone accounted for 29% of all anti-Aboriginal hate crimes in 2015, and the police did little to stop it. With Aboriginal victims, the police would often be slow to react and not follow up on leads. They would also close cases prematurely before a sure verdict could be determined. Taxi! Taxi! Go back to where you came from. It's not how we're supposed to get home. Hey, Scott, what happened to you? Okay. She's blocked out. I don't know how I'm going to get her home. Um, hope you call her boarding house or the police. No, no cops. Anything but cops. Call her boarding parents. Sky was terrified of the cops. A couple of years earlier, cops had caught her clumsily walking down a small road, drunk, late in the night. The cop was aggressive and shouted at her to get against the wall. Hey! Hey, what's happening? Shut up, I'm the cop here. Hey, what's this about? Oh. You can't do this to me. Shut up. Hey, Joe, get in here. <laughs> It's a savage. He doesn't belong in this town. He belongs in like the rest of his kind. <laughs> Fine. Let's call counselors. Hello? The counselors came and took Robin back to her house, but she never woke up. It was later confirmed that she had died of acute alcohol poisoning. If the cops hadn't been so racist to Sky in the past and so abusive to Sky, perhaps she would have called them and they could have taken Robin to the hospital and saved her life. It was a cold winter night in Thunder Bay, Ontario, when yet another Indigenous boy by the name of Jordan Wabasi went missing. Jordan was supposed to call Myra, his boarding parent, that night. So when Myra couldn't reach him, she began to worry. In fact, nobody had seen Jordan since he left a bus terminal at 10 p.m. later that day. Jordan's boarding parents officially called the police the day after he was last seen to report him missing. Detective Anderson. Hi, I'd like to report my son missing, please. All right, it's been 24 hours? Yes, sir. All right, I'll be right over. Thank you. Detective Anderson searched the house and interviewed the parents, but did not interview any other students who may have had any information regarding the whereabouts of Jordan Mabasi. Six days after his disappearance, footprints and his baseball cap were found along the river. The police assembled the dive team and began searching the water. For weeks they searched that river and nothing. Rumors began to surface that a boy at Jordan's school was saying that he chased Jordan and that Jordan tried to get away via the ice in the river, but ended up following through. The police failed to follow up on this lead, however. Finally, in early May, once the ice had thawed, the body was finally found. More rumors began to surface that a man named Steve Cole had pushed Jordan into the river. So, I heard some rumors you pushed that kid into the river. Sir, I will never do that to him. Somebody just wants me to go down. Trust me. Alright, I believe you. But if you hear anything, let me know. Okay. Instant. No problem. Yeah. Despite this extremely promising lead, the police let this extremely enticing lead go after the extremely brief and biased interview. 
Many years later, a friend of Stevens admitted in court that Steve had in fact told him that he committed the murder. The case was closed on August 24, 2011, and it was ruled an accident. It was then concluded that he had died to cold water drowning with no signs of foul play. A skinny string bean of a kid, Sean weaved and walked down the halls nodding to some of his friends new and old when he came across a new acquaintance of his, Jethro Anderson. The two met on the first day of school and immediately bonded when they found that they had much in common with them both being from small indigenous communities and everything. Jethro being from Casablanca, First Nation. They got along very well and were often seen talking before and after school about sports and school. Everything was going great until one faithful day on October 28, 2000, when Sean and Jethro attended a party with a group of friends with plans to meet up afterwards. Sean recalled seeing some of Jethro's friends urging him to leave the party. Little did Sean know, however, that that would be the last time that he would ever see his best friend Jethro Anderson alive. After 24 hours of waiting for Jethro, his worried caregiver Dora called the police on his behalf. 911, how can I help you? My nephew didn't come home last night? He's probably just parking like every other native kid. After another day with no sign of Jethro, Dora, at the first possible moment, entered the police station and filed a missing persons report on Jethro's behalf. 911, what's the emergency? Uh, my nephew Jethro is still missing. He'll be back soon. He's just out with his friends. Despite the efforts of Dora and the rest of the indigenous community, there was no sign of Jethro Anderson anywhere. It took over a week for notice to be put up in the media by the police force on November 5th, nine days after Jethro went missing. Polar Bay detectives are investigating the discovery of a body in the Kenistika River late this afternoon. The body was discovered by a group of searchers who were dragging the river looking for a missing Casablanca Lake First Nation youth. Jethro Anderson was reported missing on October 28th at 5.15 p.m. Although a positive identification of the body has not yet been completed, the physical description and the clothing are very similar to the missing 15-year-old boy, so we are positive that he is a match. Members of the Thunder Bay Police and scenes of crime unit and uniform patrol branch were at the scene. Thunder Bay Fire Authority helped in the retrieval of the body from the river and searchers found the body in 250 meters south of the restored James Whale Tug near the Kemistico River Heritage Park. They were dragging the river about 20 feet uh, full of water, four feet from the Riverside Walkway. At this point, foul play is not suspected, but a post-mortem will be conducted tomorrow morning to determine the cause of death. Thank you. As popular and as well regarded as Jethro Anderson was, he was gone in a flash. No evidence has been linked to suggest foul play in regard to this crime. However, that is likely due to the state of the body that the medical examiners had to examine the body in. This is due to the police not properly doing their job, as if they had dragged the river more continuously, as opposed to waiting for the indigenous searchers to gather the resources to do so themselves. It is likely that the body would have been found much more quickly, and that they could have found more sustainable evidence off of it. In addition, the police did not properly follow up on the leads as evident through them insisting that they were out, that he was out partying, as if they had done their jobs by putting out flyers and attempting to investigate his disappearance, that he would have been found much quicker. The police also did not do an adequate job of updating the family, often by responding with the phrases, there are no leads, and he is probably just out partying, as mentioned earlier. They're, they are indeed largely responsible as a result of this, for the emotional trauma inflicted on Dora and the rest of Jethro's family, and are to blame also for the loss of Jethro Anderson's life. I don't like the stuff they're feeding me They don't like the things I see But I don't think I need to be forgiven Well, I am crying inside Though they drag Through the storm that cracks the sky